Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 10, titled Streetwise, which isn't just a clever name, as we're going to find out later. There's a deeper meaning to that name. (laughs) (laughs) It originally premiered on December 5th, 1986. It is also almost 1987 in Miami Vice. It's time for big hair. Let's get some big hair up in here. (laughs) It is directed by Fred Walton, which this is his only episode he directs and he's done. He did some other things outside of here. But the most important thing is that it's written by Dennis Cooper. We know him well. He directed Made for Each Other, Sons and Lovers, and The Good Caller. And he still has two episodes to go. He's got quite the good vice track record. Yeah, I was going to. Say he's got quite a resume, you know, because uh, I'm gonna be honest. Spoiler alert: I, I really liked this episode. It covers a wide range of police work too. They, they were on their game <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> Before we get started, I could check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I had a nerd moment this weekend here in the Greater Phoenix area. We had the blessing of a stop along the Rick Mobile path. For those of you who are Rick and Morty fans, it's so cool. And I feel like the Rick Mobile is going to be the new Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. <laughs> like, pe- pe- people are getting genuinely excited about this thing driving around. Excited is an understatement, I think, because we got there about a half hour early. We took a bunch of pictures with Rick Mobile. They had some fans where it had um, those like noodle guys that waved their arms around. Yeah, there were Miss or Seeks. <laughs> the line. Oh, yeah. For people to buy merch because this is it's a pop up shop and you can get exclusive merch at the Rickmobile. It was two thousand people long and people were still showing up when we left. And it was gonna take hours to get through the line to get to the pop up shop. And they only have a limited quantity of stuff. I read that. Yeah. They they only bring so much stuff and a lot of times they run out. You could just wait in that line and never actually buy anything. <laughs> Dude, I would so be the guy outside selling the knockoff merchandise. <laughs> Don't wait in the line. <laughs> by, by these Mr. Me Seekers. <laughs> in true Arizona fashion, the reason why we left is because a dust storm came rolling in. Ruined everything. <laughs> Damn dust everywhere. Well, and I know that's it, this was my nerd moment over the weekend. And to be honest with you, I'm not even the biggest Rick and Morty fan. My teenage daughter is a way bigger Rick and Morty fan than I am. So I was just humbled in the presence of the masters <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of kids who know nothing about what it's like to live on the street like rick and morty fans let's talk about this episode <laughs> quite the segue there <laughs> all right i'm gonna be totally honest this is by far the weirdest miami vice open ever this one's a weird one it's like a music video that's what I could think of it. And that is 100% true because the whole opening is Trudy basically singing her part in the song Streetwise. <laughs> and there's going to be lots more information about that in the music segment. So stick around until we get to the to that segment because you're going to hear all about the song Streetwise and the amazing music of Don Johnson. <laughs> I've been waiting for this oh, for yeah. so long. <laughs> You know, and actually, we're we're gonna cover Don Johnson, the man, the myth, the legend, completely. So, um, I I just want to say, thank God we're back to hookers. <laughs> That's what Dominic said. Ah, oh, hookers. <laughs> Hooker Row, Miami Hooker Row. I hope you never change. <laughs> it's just shots of various women. Random conversations and Trudy berating people on the street. Going like, hey, don't you want me? When people drive, just driving by. (laughs) Hey, I'm in the street. Don't you see me? (laughs) Is that how that works? (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I guess where hookers are prevalent, they just stand out in traffic and scream at cars. I I guess that's the norm. I guess because that's how this episode ends, too, is with a hooker yelling at cars to stay drive by. So uh, for the record, as people who have lived where there's a lot of hookers, I'm not going to say where that was, but <laughs> that, is, that, <laughs> that happens all the time. <laughs> like, where women are just, like, yelling in the, and they're yelling into cars and walking in the middle of the street. In Let, the middle l- of- let's get back to the old Ramrod Motel. <laughs> oh, my God, that name. I'm like, it's a Ramrod Motel. I wonder what's going on there. Trudy walks over and radios in this white tech out in front of the Ramrod Motel. It's just 
says it's a full house and Switek says it's party time. And then it goes to the opening credits. This is by far the strangest feeling I've had from a Miami Vice open in all however many 60-ish episodes, maybe 55 episodes of Miami Vice that we've watched. But it was extremely 80s, though. That is true. (laughs) When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the Ramrod Motel. Which the sign <laughs> pay hourly. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> the best part about the Ramrod Hotel is that the sign is neon, so that means it's a real motel in the city of Miami. We need to go to Miami and stay <laughs> at the Ramrod. <laughs> so Itek is passing out search warrants to the officers. They're going to go through and do a sweep on the motel. Obviously, they can't do the sweep on the hookers on the street. They need to go sweep the hotel that's on Hooker Row. Well, they have no proof they're doing anything wrong. I mean, they could just be walking around. My, my favorite part of the scene is the fat guy that comes out and starts running. <laughs> Tubbs gets a great like, strong safety tackle on him down the street, too. He's like the manager oh, yeah. or like the front desk worker. He's got his money box. Like, I was really get away. for him. I, I was honestly rude. I was like, run, fat man, run. <laughs> And here I was in my head, like, don't say he's fat. Don't say about the fat guy. I'm like, don't talk about how fat he was. <laughs> man can move. Yeah, man he could. Can move. He could run. <laughs> Inside, while they're doing this sweep, we see, like, officers starting to break into rooms. And then in one of the rooms, we're seeing a close-up of people making out a blonde woman that we saw that was on the street in the open. And then another man who we don't know yet, who is actually Bill Paxton. Going to come back to that in a second. She goes into her purse, gets out a vial of coke, and he tells her to stop because he's a cop. It's like, oh, interesting. And then we see a couple b- bus. One, Stan busts into a room in the middle of a solid S&M session with a man on a leash on his knees. There was some kinky <laughs> stuff going on in that room. <laughs> and then the duo busts into Bill Paxton's room, who we find out later his name is Vic, and they arrest them and crockett asks him where did the badge come from he doesn't believe that he's a cop so wait a minute not the duo though right isn't it just crockett and stan that break oh it might be yeah yeah it might be just crockett and switek which you know that and that reminds me is that switek just left they're busting down all the all the prostitutes down except for the one that's got someone on a leash she's good just leave her alone he's like oh sorry i didn't remember (laughs) yeah Yeah. Turns out they're really from Illinois, and they're on their second honeymoon. (laughs) (laughs) So you heard me right. That is Bill Paxton in this episode. The fantastic Hollywood actor in a ton of movies. So, John, I'm sure you got a lot of information on on Bill. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, Paxton, sci-fi royalty, because, I mean, he's the only actor to basically have parts in... The Terminator franchise, the Aliens franchise, and the Predator franchise. Being in, he played a punk thug in the original Terminator. He played Private Hudson in Aliens and was also in Predators 2 in 1990. Up until Vice, though, it was, it was actually mostly bit parts. So, like I said, he played the punk thug. He also played a bully older brother in Weird Science. Mm. So, no, but it I wasn't until that. after Vice that he really started nailing movie roles like True Lies, Titanic, Apollo 13, Twister, Edge of Tomorrow. He's also known for his HBO series Big Love, which was from... 2006 to 2011 he actually like don johnson had a bit of time in the, in the music industry what was he a rapper <laughs> <laughs> oh no first we'll talk about his appearances in music videos he directed the barnes and barnes novelty song called fish heads which debuted on snl in their 80 to 81 season he played a nazi radio officer pat benatard's 82 single shadows of the night (laughs) and even as even as soon as 2003 he played a sheriff in a limp biscuit music video called eat you alive (laughs) (laughs) well we know that he's going that's that role (laughs) that's not all that is not all In 1982, Paxton and his friend Andrew Todd Rosenthal formed a new wave band called Martini Ranch. The band released their only full-length album, Holy Cow, in 1988, (laughs) and it was produced by Devo member Bob Cassell Hmm. and featured guest appearances by two of the Devo band members. Music video for their single, 
Breach? Directed by James Cameron, who he would later work with in the movies oh Titanic and True Lies. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> yes. You know, I definitely, if I point to a single moment where I remember Bill Paxton, is in Aliens, obviously, and then Apollo 13. Um, like those are the two go-to Are for you me. forgetting about Tombstone? True. Come on, he's a huge part of that. <laughs> true, true. Okay, you got me there. He is. And unfortunately, we lost Bill Paxton in February of this year. And a huge yeah, surprise. He, pa- he passed away this year from complications from surgery. Uh, I guess he was in getting his heart valve repaired and passed away during the surgery. It was such a shock because you're right, John. He he was such a sci-fi god because he was in so many great sci-fi movies. He was in just a lot of movies in general. And whenever you see him, you just got this general sense that he was just a good guy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, he was definitely one of those actors that are probably like the most likely you'd want to have a beer with. Exactly. Exactly. Well, when we come out of the motel, we head we head over to the precinct. And this is where they're booking the blonde that Bill Paxton was with, or Vic. I'm going to call him now for the rest of the episode. They're booking in Carla. That's his girlfriend, even though he's married. Yeah, let's not talk about that part. <laughs> <laughs> She keeps saying that they're in love. Switek is booking her. He's like, I just want to know where you got the drugs. Tubbs runs down Castillo and tells him the report on the drugs that they found on Carla. And it's pharmaceutical grade cocaine, which until I watched Miami Vice, I did not know was a thing, nor was a common street problem as it is as often as it is in Miami Vice. I didn't know it was going to be so much pharmaceutical grade cocaine on the streets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do they have it anyway? Wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what the exact difference is between pharmaceutical grade and Coke cut with like baking soda. I don't I, I don't get how it makes it better. I don't know. I kind of would like a, a show to go along with Miami Vice to explain what drugs and slang and stuff that they're using. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All I know is that they were in for a good time. Cope and a hooker uh, in a cheap <laughs> motel. Man, he was ready to party. <laughs> Tubbs is telling Castillo that Vic says he got it from an informant. And that's what we see at the motel scene, too, is that Vic's saying he got it from one of his informants. He's been working vice in Overtown, but he's been doing it for 10 months. He's deep in undercover. So this is all the stuff that Tubbs is also relaying to Castillo. And Gina and Trudy, Castillo says that Gina and Trudy are going to go try and investigate the source that he said, the informant, that the drugs came from. We have a quick scene where we see the pimp for Carla, which we saw in the opening, where she had given him some money. And the pimp is actually Wesley Snipes. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a couple scenes because Wesley Snipes really shows he is a no-holds-barred <laughs> pimp. <laughs> he, he, he is, is a convincing ruthless. pimp that was yeah th- i literally wrote that down like wow he's a convincing pimp <laughs> convincing pimp <laughs> highlighted <laughs> I, i'm sure that was on his resume you know <laughs> wesley snipes can't play convincing pimp drug dealer <laughs> not a shot victim though <laughs> 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 He pulls up to a house and he picks up someone who we see with him throughout the episode. We never really find out who this other person is. Just kind of a crony that's always with him. And they're going to go find someone named Roxanne. So we go to the street and the ladies are working. They're t- out talking to the street girls. What's great about the hooker scenes, especially with the ladies in the scenes, is that the ladies have such attitude as they're walking up and down the street. Yeah, they're hookers. <laughs> <laughs> they have hooker attitude, okay? And no bras, apparently. None to be found. <laughs> the pimp, Silk, pulls up and they grab someone off the street. They grab Roxanne up off the street and they force her into the car and they drive away. Gina sees it, comes over and picks up the wallet that Roxanne had dropped while they were grabbing her and throwing her into the car. And it's got this... It's like a hotel room key, but we find out later it's a lockbox key. It's like a locker key. Then we go over to the hotel where Silk is viciously beating Roxanne to get information out of her. She was supposed to pick up drugs and deliver them, but she never delivered them. The drugs are just gone. He also wants to know where Carla, the blonde from our opening and the girlfriend of Vic, got the coke for what she was arrested for. And she said that 
She did pick it up. She didn't know where it was, but she had given Carla a taste of it. And then Roxanne in her, tries to defend herself and attacks Silk with a razor. Silk then grabs Roxanne, throws her on the bed, pulls out a knife, and we cut away. Mm-hmm. This is a brutal scene because Silk really beats her up bad. Yeah, even yeah, and she's begging for her life. It was also a shock to see Wesley Snipes in this role. Yeah, he's hardly ever... Well, I guess in New Jack City he was a bad guy, but that's like the only... That, well- that's what I was going to say is actually kind of his first few movie roles. He played a drug dealer or drug dealer. <laughs> so <laughs> Miami Vice kind of led him to getting more roles as drug dealers, apparently. Not, he was never a pimp again. No, <laughs> never a pimp again. I don't know. He was kind of a pimp and can't jump. I mean, not literally. Obviously, Wesley Snipes from the Blade Trilogy movies. He was also in Passenger 57, New Jack City, White Men Can't Jump, Major League, Demolition Man, Money Train. Just all, all kinds of great movies, particularly big action star in the, in the 90s. No matter what action movies you say, I always think of Wesley Snipes for two things. One, selling those exercise equipment with Chuck Norris on TV infomercials in the 90s. Hey, he had money. He needed <laughs> money, okay? And two, as uh, Willie Mays Hayes yeah, from Major, Major League. League. I yeah. always, always go back to that one. Which, it surprised me that he was only in the original Major League. He didn't do any of the sequels. Yeah, that is pretty surprising. So, was. Snipes actually has been training in martial arts since he was 12 years old. He's a fifth degree black belt in Shotokan Karate and a second degree black belt in Hapkido, as well as training in Kung Fu, Ju- Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and kickboxing, among others. So he's actually a badass. I guess in 2005, he was in negotiations to fight UFC commentator and comedian Joe Rogan. <laughs> well, if you don't know anything, you guys think of Joe Rogan at, from like news radio where like he was the host of Fear Factor and stuff. But Joe Rogan actually was has been a career mixed martial artist himself. And so that would have actually... Joe Rogan, and this is this is kind of my point here. Joe Rogan could probably kick butt of most of the actual action stars. Like he could probably take out <laughs> Jason Statham, like in reality. So, but the fight ended up falling through. Also, had a bit of tax trouble in 2006. They indicted him for all kinds of stuff, and he actually his defense was a tax protester theory called the 861 argument. At the end, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but at the end, he was convicted of three misdemeanor charges and got three years in prison. Uh, three and years ended up in reporting. prison for misdemeanor tax evasion charges? Damn. Oh, dude. He got off easy compared to the other. He, he was indicted along with Eddie Ray Khan and Doug Rosile. Uh, he got three years in prison. Eddie Ray Khan got 10 years in jail. And Doug Rosile got four and a half. Mm-hmm. So he actually got off a little easier than the rest. Wow. If only he could stage he a re- fight with a former UFC fighter to get it, solve all his tax <laughs> problems. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if uh-huh. only. <laughs> he he reported to federal prison December 10th and after several appeals being denied was released after his full sentence term on April th- 2013. So, so not only did he have to go but he served his full sentence like he didn't get out early No, he did his whole sentence, yeah. Wow. He did. He nope. still says he's innocent. Yeah. Like if you listen to him talk he says like that it was all a mistake and he's innocent. People don't understand it. Two things I'm going to point out. One, his first appearance in film or anything was in the movie Wildcats with Goldie Hawn. And then Vice was the very next kind of credit. You can definitely tell in this episode, like, if, if you were just watching, like, that man's got a future. Like, Oh, yeah, for like, sure. In, in comparison to Miami Vice actors, he's like, yeah, this guy was good as a secondary actor. Such a future. That he was actually cast in my, as Michael Jackson's nemesis in the music video Bad, which was directed by Martin Scorsese. That is that is quite the list. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, did you catch that? Martin Scorsese <laughs> directed, directed the music that. video Bad. <laughs> are, like, are you kidding me? It's just two other things that might catch you off guard. So he was in The Expendables 3. He was mm-hmm. actually supposed to be in The Expendables 1. He was supposed to play the role of Hail Caesar, played by Terry Crews. But he couldn't leave the U.S. Do, uh, without U.S. court's approval. <laughs> Sorry. <it's funny> though. <laughs> Nothing against Terry Crews, but it would have been better with Wesley Snipes. Of course it would have. And I remember... Yeah, and obviously, when, that, and, that that's why they had to cast him in the third one. 
which I remember when we watched for the first time we ever watched the first one, I was like, where's Wesley Snipes? And why is Terry Crews in it? Sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> he, he was Sorry. on probation and he couldn't leave the U.S. <laughs> the only other thing I want to touch on is that he was actually considered for the role of Jordy LaForge on Star Trek Next Generation, which, by the way, was ended up going to LeVar Burton. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is I'm going to have to agree with the, the casting of LeVar Burton because no matter how much I love Wesley oh. Snipes, LeVar Burton is an American hero. <laughs> <laughs> he is a great <laughs> man. Hey, I love LeVar, LeVar Burton. So, and I grew up watching uh, LeVar Burton on Greeting Rainbow. Okay. But could you imagine Wesley Snipes on Star Trek? Like, I'm just, I mean, I'm already a Trekkie. Uh, I, I'd have lost my mind. <laughs> I stand by my statement. LeVar Burton is an American hero. <laughs> <laughs> After Wesley Snipes or Silk is done murdering yes. Roxanne, which we don't see, we're going to come back to it. We have a we bounce back over to the precinct and Crockett and Tubbs are talking to Castillo and they're also interrogating Vic. He's sticking to a story. Castillo wants his boss's name, and then he just storms out of the office. Crockett hangs around for a little bit, talks to him alone. He says, I know what you're going through. I've been here before. I've don't fallen in love with hookers, and it ruined my marriage. Like last week. It just <laughs> happened, okay? Uh, well, but, I, I love Crockett talking when he was talking with the lieutenant. He's like, you know, he's out of control. And, that, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, like, then of course Crockett can relate because he's out of control. <laughs> <laughs> you leave him alone he's perfectly fine <laughs> but in that conversation castillo says he's gonna call ia like he's supposed to yeah. it's protocol yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and crockett talks him out of it he says give me a couple of days he's gonna get us all the evidence that we need which turns out he doesn't give him crap that carl is the one that's actually able to help them and then they're able to through good police work go find the other stuff he didn't want to do any yes. of that police work, okay? <laughs> he just wanted a shortcut. And then that's when Trudy calls and says that they found Roxanne's body. Crockett six to just give me a couple days and we'll see what we can get out of him. Castillo agrees, but he says he wants detailed paperwork and Vic doesn't get any contact with Carla. Two things Sonny can never promise. Not only could he make sure there's no contact, but he also will not do detailed paperwork. No. <laughs> vague. He'll do very vague. <laughs> eh, yes. I think I was here when it happened. I'm not really sure. Crockett goes and tells Vic, who's still in the office, he tells him what's going to happen. And Vic says he doesn't want his pity, that he'll just take care of it. In reality, most of this episode, Crockett is talking to himself. Yeah, because Vic is an idiot. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I mean, but he is. Know, He's an idiot. <laughs> This whole conversation is kind of meaningless because basically the whole time Crockett's like, hey, man, I'll be your buddy. You can tell <laughs> me your secrets. You know, and the whole time Vic's pretty much telling him to screw off that yeah. he's in love with Carla and he's not going to leave his wife, but they're going to he, he's going to end up with Carla and they're going to have happily ever after. Yeah, you somehow. Know? But, some, but don't leave. talk about his wife. He's like, when they ask, don't talk about my wife. Yeah, because like, I don't want to think about her. <laughs> somehow this yeah. was almost a prequel to Big Love. <laughs> Just oh my saying. god, it could have been. <laughs> Over at the hotel, Switek comes in and says that they found Coke on her body. It matches the same pharmaceutical grade that was in that Carla had, so that means that this links back to the same pimp. They don't not 100 percent sure who that is. They think they think it's silk. Trudy gives him the wallet that that Gina had found on the street. Like I was saying, they're pretty sure that it's silk, but they're not gonna move on him yet. They have no evidence, they have no witnesses, they're gonna do good police work. Good job, Miami. <laughs> also, homicide doesn't need to bother investigating this because, you know, I mean, it's not like there's any dead bodies here. You know, we'll 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 handle it from here, guys. So now they're just gonna go talk to Silk, and Vic might know where he's at. So he takes them over to the checker club. Now, this is just Sonny and Vic. It's just these two because Tubbs is going on a different route. And not as cops. Crockett's no. not going to go talk to him as a cop. <laughs> yeah, he's going as Burnett. They're having a conversation in the car. Vic says that he wants to rescue Carla, that the pimp that she's been working for, Silk, he's brutal. But in the long term, he wants to rescue her, but he's still undercover, so he can't do anything about it. That This is when Crockett asks about his wife, and you see the shock look on Paxton's face. Like, how did you find out? He's like, I read your file. I know all about you. <laughs> Carla, 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 Carla this, Carla that. You know, <laughs> but I'm undercover, so I can't leave my wife or anything. But Carla, Carla, 
<laughs> so eventually they get tired of talking about Carla and, and Sonny decides to go in the club and very strange way introduces himself <laughs> to Silk. Hi, Silk. I'm Sonny. How you doing? Yeah, I know. That whole thing was very weird the way it played out. It was, hey, by the way, I'm here to steal your business. Nice to meet you. <laughs> That's the nicest way to threaten a rival drug dealer. <laughs> he like all smiles the whole time. <laughs> Hey, Jump pal, us. we're we're your competition. You're going to give us 10%. <laughs> By golly, we're in the same business. <laughs> Silk doesn't bite, though. He just tells Barnett to get lost. And then he goes into another meeting out back behind the checker club. And this time it's with his boss, Leo. Leo's in a limo. He's high scale. He's like um, a dealer at the large level. Then he's got all street dealers that are, that are dealing for him. And he doesn't actually believe in Silk that much. He keeps flaunting over him like, I'm just going to get it to someone else. You're not taking care of me. Also, by the way, what happened to that shipment you lost? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and really quickly, you start to see like Silk's like on the verge of getting fired here. <laughs> in the drug game, when you get fired, you don't just get unemployment or anything. Like You get killed. <laughs> 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 so leo says he wants him to go bail out carl and her friend vic and then find out what what they know if they can locate that package that they're missing silk also asks about burnett leo says that he's going to take care of that so there was an off-screen conversation that we didn't hear where no, he apparently. told him about this weird conversation he had with some random person <laughs> that just walked up to him inside some the club canadian drug dealer <laughs> <laughs> some white guy came up to me and said hey you want to be friends i said no <laughs> At the precinct, Tubbs is talking to Castillo, and Tubbs is just like talking out loud, like wants to know why Vic is protecting Carla so much. Tubbs says he wants to find out what's happening. Tubbs says, we're not. You are. Yeah. Yes. Castillo says, we're not going to, but you are. <laughs> Back at the checker club, Castillo calls Crockett and says that Vic is on house arrest until otherwise notified. So actually... For the rest of the episode, we don't see Vic until the very end. At Vic's house, Crockett pulls up with Vic to drop him off. His wife is leaving for work. She just looks at Vic and says, like, I already know the I IA already called. And then Crockett gives some words of encouragement to Vic as he storms inside of his house. And then he asks Vic's wife, so, you seen your husband much lately? He's like, yeah, rub salt in the wound. No, obviously I haven't. Or I would have known he was yeah. sleeping with a hooker while I was being a nurse at night. <laughs> uh. <laughs> this guy's poor wife, man. We don't see her again, but it's it's not getting any better. No, because no. he acts like he's being like a kid and he's brought home in trouble, right? He's like, I'm going to go in my house and be grounded and I won't be able to see my girlfriend anymore because she's a hooker and I'm a policeman. Uh. Uh, oh, yeah, then there's my wife. But wait, she's such a <laughs> nag. <laughs> At the county jail, Vic is talking to Carl on the phone. He says he can't bail her out. Obviously, there's too much heat on him to bail His her out. mom won't let him out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> she apologizes about the drugs, wants him to say that he loves her, which he doesn't say. Because he doesn't. She's a hooker. <laughs> We get more proof later on when he tells her that she, she can stay at a shelter. <laughs> well, I mean, he can't ruin what he's got going on with his wife. She takes care of him. <laughs> the lousy cheating bastard can't spring for a motel room? <laughs> no. Yeah, no. Apparently not. Gina, no, honey, you got to stay at the shelter. <laughs> Gina is also working deep undercover, like in the jail, working undercover. And she comes up she's to Carl. She's working. She's taking her break. She just takes her <laughs> lunch break in the in the lockup with the hookers. Gina starts talking to Carla. Says that you gotta get yourself a new pimp. I got a pimp, Butch. Which I, my, <laughs> sorry, that name. My favorite Tubbs <laughs> undercover name. <laughs> Butch takes care of me. He'll come bail you out if you give him a call. You should switch pimps. Butch is the one. You know, because you can do that like, really super easily. <laughs> Just like transfer over. Like, I don't want to work with you anymore. So uh, I'm going to go to this other guy. <laughs> this On is my favorite Tubbs undercover. Yeah. Because <laughs> the whole thing is really funny, actually. If you think it's take it out of context that he's, he's trying to be a pimp. It is pretty funny. <laughs> Tubbs, Tubbs uh, conversion to be a pimp is him putting on a goofy hat. <laughs> <laughs> that is Tubbs the pimp. And a shiny shirt <laughs> at wearing... one point. <laughs> yeah, a shiny dress shirt. Like, whoa. On the street, Trudy is Sorry. just like pacing up and down the street talking about how great Butch is. <laughs> you like, know, that's how you, that works. You just go rock around and go like, my man is so good. You guys are, you're out of luck. You can't have him. And the other hookers say, this is 
someone else's sugar corner. bear yeah sugar bear Don't and they whistle and have him come over and then trudy desperately calls him like okay now guys please here comes this pimp sugar bear is a giant by the way he gets out of that car and the whole car like <laughs> shakes <laughs> whoa that's why she got scared right away she's like oh crap <laughs> the police come up and raid his girls and him and then trudy goes over to talk to Tubbs. he comes pulling up like you know look at me how great my pimp is he doesn't even get bothered by the cops but then Tubbs immediately gets a call on the car phone and says and it's gina saying that carla is ready to talk they didn't even really need to do this there was no street set up that was necessary except for the day he says he wants a kiss and she says like you had your chance <laughs> when was that yeah chance? i know when was that i want to go back to that <laughs> there's something deeper going on here we gotta dig yeah <laughs> it must have been when when i was in jail you know oh yeah they had that she was conjugal. jumping around on him <laughs> quick scene at the jail silk shows up but he finds out that butch has already bailed out carla and he sees them leaving so then we go over to the checker club and butch is sitting there talking to carla he's talking about how much of a chump of a pimp she had before he literally said that <laughs> <laughs> i had a chump you should come work for me <laughs> silk comes over and tries to grab carla back and tubs lays the fantastic slapping ass whooping yeah. that we know <laughs> Tubbs is good for. He loves to slap people around. <laughs> Tubbs is beating him up and the bartender comes over and says, take it outside. And so that's what Tubbs does. He goes outside and starts slapping around Silk again <laughs> outside. <laughs> Tubbs says that he now owns his streets and his girls. He wants 10% of his take, and he leaves with Carla. At the precinct, Everyone keeps asking for 10%. Something's weird about this. <laughs> I also want to point out that the Vice team is on it this week. In the very next scene, we see them that they've got the Coke out of the locker. So they've got the Coke, they've got the girl, and they got the pimp on the run. They're getting stuff done. As a team, too, except for Zito. Poor <laughs> yeah. Zito. <laughs> poor poor Zito he's taking a lot of vacation this season <laughs> a lot of vacation days to use up for some reason I'm not quite sure <laughs> and in true Crockett fashion at the precincts when they're trying to figure out how they're going to pull Silk out and get these drugs to him that way they can pull him out and make a true bust Crockett suggests why don't we just put one of our witnesses in harm's way and have Carla deliver it? Maybe he doesn't really like yeah. Carla. <laughs> yes, but that is exactly. He's always the one that uh, recommends it, and it's always his fault when they get killed. <laughs> 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 now we go back to Butch. Butch is whining and dining Carla. And see, in the previous scene, Castillo says he has a way to get Carla to cooperate. So that means that they're going to use Tubbs, Butch. As a pimp, though. Uh-huh, as the it, pimp it, to and, convince Carla. And Tubbs is giving her the pretty woman treatment, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, he um, sure is. Yeah, he's like, oh, and I, I could get you this and that. And will you take me dancing? He's like, of course I'll take you. Do whatever you want. And so, then, but then as soon as, he, as soon as he throws it out there about her, you know, taking the key to Silk and possibly getting killed, she's not having it. He just flips that switch. Like, Tubbs going to smack a bitch. <laughs> he's not the, tubs butch okay <laughs> he does really good butch. like he's believable as a pimp right like yeah. this is exactly the way that this would go but then when she starts to fight back with him then she collapses and says don't hurt me too bad he shows her his badge and his true heart comes out that he cares and he's not going to actually hurt her he it hurts him to see her in such pain Although he did smack her around a little bit before he did it, though. He slammed her into the wall. like Yeah, I mean, but, you I know, mean sometimes it takes a while to come out of character acting. I don't know. <laughs> he had I'm the suspicious hat on. about this. <laughs> he had the hat on. He got a little carried away. He was in character. The hat got knocked off in the scuffle, and then he turned back into regular tubs. <laughs> not, yes. Pip, not Pip Butch. <laughs> that's how it's like. When, it's like over yes. the top when he turns his hat around, and he goes, "That's when I become." <laughs> so of thing. course he tells Dad, but Dad's working more angles than anybody. So two things with this. Yeah, he calls Dad, and Castillo does have alternate ways on how this can go down. But two, Dad is very upset. 
I'm I'm starting to be concerned about Castillo. He looks like he's very severely depressed. Uh, also, I mentioned like <laughs> yes. why was he at his desk and there was no? It's like dark outside, so it's like nighttime, <laughs> really nighttime. He's at his desk and there's no papers there, and it looks like when he called him, he even woke up. So he's like <laughs> snoring in yeah, the it's seat. Like no light on. He's just sitting in there like I hate my job. I hate these people. They don't know how to do anything. I have to do everything for them. <laughs> just increasingly throughout the season, I'm getting more and more concerned for Castillo's mental health. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Not just his mental health. I mean, he he he. The way he always is always like leaning over at his desk, like he got an ulcer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, name uh, name one time you've ever seen Castillo smile. True, true. I think the only time is when he saw it, like his wife he thought was dead. His dead <laughs> wife brought it out of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it takes to make that man smile. A dead wife. <laughs> Castiel just tells Tubbs, hey, there's another way. Just wait it out. Crockett pulls up to Vic's house and says that Carl is facing c- conspiracy charges. And Vic goes, how can I help? And they just run to the car and drive away. It didn't take much for Vic to get on the Crockett train. We have a- another fast scene with Leo, the boss, the main boss boss, where he's at the university and he's picking up his drugs from the professor. The professor doesn't want to do this forever, but... Leo is playing hardball, so we'll break his legs. And because apparently the professor owes him money from gambling. From gambling again, so we mm-hmm. got Vice this thing up some more. Silk then calls Leo on the car phone and says that there's some new player, Butch, and he's bailed out Carla. And this is the only question I have in the storyline. All of this is that then Leo says, "Okay, you take care of Tubbs or Butch and Carla. You take care of the new one, and I'm going to take care of Burnett." Like, wow, things escalated very quickly with Burnett from just a like a 30 second conversation that Sonny had with Silk. Yeah, he's going to get murdered over a 30 second conversation (laughs) just for saying hi to someone at a bar. Hey, how you doing? We're in the same business. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, and that's why I can't really fault the vice team too much. Their police work has been on point. But the one thing that they failed to do in this is figure out that Silk has a boss. They're unaware of this guy, Leo, that he's answering to. And I think the reason is, till this escalated from 30-second conversation to planned murder, Leo's pretty much been an absentee partner. Exactly. And they just kind of luck their way into finding out that Leo exists. We have a really fast scene at the high rise where they're using Vic to convince Carla to be to make the phone call and go as the setup to get him the drugs. That way they can go bust him. And then when Crockett goes to drop off Vic back at his house because Carla makes the phone call, everything's rolling. She's going to go with Butch. Butch is going to deliver her back to Silk and then they'll use that to bust Silk. They still don't know about Leo. But when Crockett drops off Vic at his house, the car from Leo's team comes pulling up and tries to do a drive by on them crashes one person gets out crockett chases off after him and when he catches him a few houses down the man immediately says leo my boss wanted me to kill you and there's another hit on the way because he didn't know he was a cop that's that's, that was his defense on that he thought he was just some guy who was gonna kill him like oh and then he pulled out his bag like oh man i'm so stupid why did i tell you why did i tell you all that information right away also who was driving that car and why can't they drive The yeah. worst right drive by in, ever. Yeah, where you do a drive by, then yes. you crash right into a parked RV. Ain't they ever seen colors? <laughs> 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 the hit driver was made by Mark McCauley, and I just want to give him an honorable mention because he's appeared in five episodes of Vice, playing five different characters, <laughs> and is one of three actors to appear in both the TV show and the movie where he played an air traffic supervisor. How many times they got to kill this he, man in Miami Vice? <laughs> I know. He was also in a TV movie called Extra Long Moving Target with Philip Michael Thomas. <laughs> Wait a he minute. He was in three episodes of There's Nash Bridges. There's a movie Bridges. about Philip Michael Thomas in it? Like made for TV movie with him in it? <laughs> yes. I want to find that Extra right now. Extra Large Moving Target. <laughs> <laughs> So he was also in three episodes of Nash Bridges with Don Johnson, Passenger 57 with Wesley Snipes. Oh, wow. He made friends on set. <laughs> this Apparently. guy can network. <laughs> he can schmooze, I swear. <laughs> Hell yeah. So he's also been in a hundred different roles since his Vice debut. And actually, if you see his picture, he, you probably recognize something that he guest starred in or something. Uh, just because of our 
love of terrible movies, I do want to inform you, he was also in No Retreat, No Surrender, number three. <laughs> oh my god, they made, I didn't know they made three of those, actually. <laughs> Excuse me, I need to go do some backwards sit-ups with my friends sitting on my lap. I eating a popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Quick pop. <laughs> no Retreat. <laughs> <laughs> you guys let me down oh, on that sorry. one. <laughs> sorry, we were too busy laughing about the movie. No surrender. There you I'm go. Still, I, I'm still in awe that they made three of them. <laughs> Someone's got to keep Sean Claude Van Damme busy. Hey, he wasn't in those <laughs> other two. While <laughs> Crockett was running down uh, his attempted murderer, Vic gets in the crashed drive-by car and leaves the scene so now crockett he has he has arrested this person vic is gone he gets a call from switech and switech says that they've got the boss's limo sorry let me back up crockett then calls in i'm sorry i'm losing it here what is the order does crockett call switech oh. and say that that it's someone else that's someone named leo yeah he must do that well, I yeah, think okay. they already, no, yeah, so, I think they knew who it was already. I, I know why you get confused, and it's the same re- as the reason why I'm I get a little confused. So he comes out after realizing that Leo's called hits out on him and his partner. He calls in about finding Leo to Zwitek, and they fi- and they call him back and say they found the limo. He loads in the hitman in the Ferrari with him. Books out to where Zwitek has got the limo. Gets the hitman to. Finger his boss, takes a, and gets the boss to squeal on where the hit's going down for Butch or his partner Tubbs. Which brings up the question, why didn't they know where Tubbs was meeting Silk? And why does he not have backup with him? I didn't understand that either when Crockett's like, where's it going to go? Well, it's always going to go down where Tubbs is at, right? <laughs> why didn't <laughs> anyone know where Tubbs was? And Okay, so if they didn't know how, yes. where Tubbs was going to where it was going to go down, then how did Bill Paxton know to go there? <laughs> Uh, exactly. I mean, there's this what? No. <laughs> Crockett's doing this frantic search, dry, uh, cruising around with the hitman in cuffs, trying to figure out where the heck Tubbs is. Romano took the hitman's car, drove right there. Which, no explanation <laughs> why he goes there either. I guess it's to help her. Like, he has a feeling of what's going to happen because, because he sees the, the drive by. Oh, yeah. They are. That's true, yeah. And so he races over to the two checkers, and Tubbs and Carla have already gone inside. We see in the parking lot that. Silk and his partner have put on masks. They're going to go shoot up Butch inside of Checkers. Carla, in the meantime, says that she's going to go fix her face, but sneaks out the back because she knew that Vic was coming. No, she just doesn't want to do this. Mm. So she's like nervous. She's like, I can't do it. He's going to see me. He's going to know. And mm-hmm. Tubbs like, you're going to be fine. Stop being nervous. You're okay. And she's like, okay, well, I need to fix my, fa- fix my face because I hate when I look like this. So I think she was just going to leave because she was afraid. And then Silk sees her in the parking lot and a shootout starts because Vic pulls up right then. Shootout starts. Tubbs shoots and kills the partner. Silk Vic tries takes to one flee. In the chest. <laughs> yeah, Vic takes one. Then Silk tries to flee, but Crockett shows up right then. There's a little parking lot chase. Silk gets out, tries to run. There's a shootout with Crockett. Crockett shoots and kills Silk. Yeah, with 94 in the bullets. Most ridiculous fashion. So, I, I swear to God, like his legs kind of did like one, uh, like like cartoonish, like up in the air, like as he jumped back <laughs> when he got shot. And then we jump over to where Vic is, and Carl is holding him. He's been shot, like you mentioned, John, in the chest, and he dies in her arms. Almost everyone dies. Leo is the only one in all this that survives. Well, in the the original hitman, his the guy that works for him is still alive. And Carla, she's still alive. <laughs> the original hitman's not only alive, he's sitting in the passenger seat of <laughs> yeah, Crockett's well, all going Ferrari on. <laughs> watching the, the gunfight go on. Damn, that guy's really dead. <laughs> he shot him a bunch of times. After all of this good police work, it ends in a gunfight and a bunch of people are dead. They're telling the hooker, Carla, hey, we're going to take care of yeah, so I mean, at least she doesn't end up in a shelter, I guess. <laughs> no, um, they take her straight to a halfway house, so she can get cleaned up and she can like clean up her life, and they have yeah. a lot more leeway. And she won't have any now that Vic is dead and she helped. She like participated mm-hmm. in the investigation. They have all this extra help they can give her. Poor Vic's wife, man. <laughs> like she has no idea that her, her husband was banging a hooker, that he died protecting a hooker. They was going to leave her for a hooker. I guess a cop's just going to show up and say, like, oh, your husband's dead. 
<laughs> well, I, mean, I think she knows he was with a hooker because that's why the IA was investigating him. So she knows that much. But he was a vice cop. That doesn't mean he was banging her. Uh, I think she. I think that was <laughs> insinuated. <laughs> well, the last scene in the episode is the ladies in the duo are talking. They're kind of finishing up the briefs from the case. And then Crockett gets into his car and Tubbs gets into wearing a silly hat. <laughs> is it just me or, or are they snorting sweet and low or something? <laughs> You're just playing with it, I think. I think that's it was like the camera angles were set up to make it look that way. That way you weren't sure who was talking or like what they were doing. And then it's slowly built to like, oh, it's the vice team. And they're just having those little Cuban coffees. Mm-hmm. Oh, because like I was never confused at it being the vice team, even though they were doing that with the camera angle below their head. So you couldn't see them. Well, they can't fool you, John. To figure out. <laughs> <laughs> Like, who's cutting that line and who's snorting sweet and low? Like, what the hell's going on? (laughs) When Tubbs gets into the car, he asks Crockett, is it all worth it just for Carla? Like, if she just gets clean, gets off the street. And Crockett says, it's got to be that if there's a bright spot in it, that's got to be worth it. And they drive away. Then you see them driving down Hooker Row again. And you see come out of the motel, Carla, and she's back working the street. So it ended up all being for nothing. Okay. Yeah. And well, she's doing the, still rocking the, the singing hat. talk. She's doing the singing talking, too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. I hope Tubbs keeps the hat. You know that's I, I hope personal Tubbs hat. keeps the hat. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tubbs will lose the hat but gain a beard. And I think that's a popular choice. I love the beard. I love beard tubs. <laughs> and like you mentioned, John, this is a good episode. I really did like this episode. I don't really have any nitpicking on it either. Like, it's just, it's good. They have a lot of good police work. The team works together, minus Zito. And they're able to bring everyone down. They don't shoot. It's not like, vice freeze, clang, clang, clang. And they start shooting, like, just murdering people. It's, it's all justifiable shooting. <laughs> unlike other times. Yeah, and I mean, there aren't really any of those really big plot holes, except that the very end gets a little confused because they don't know where Cro- where Tubbs is beating them. But outside of that, there's really no plot holes. It's solid police work. It's a detailed case. And from beginning to end, it's really solid. The the episode just moves along. Let's go talk about the music because this music is single. Artist is Don Johnson. So let's go talk about this music. All right, Melissa. I know you've been waiting. Dying. Waiting (laughs) for this moment. Talking about Don Johnson's music, which did perform well and produced many hits. So, John, um, what do you got for us on yeah, John Johnson's Yeah, it did. Music? And I own the albums. There were two. <laughs> Little known was the second, but I did own it. <laughs> so let's talk about, I promised in the beginning, Don Johnson, the man, the myth, the legend. His song, Streetwise, was the song featured. Let's just start out with what Don Johnson is known the best for. What he was famous for. His world champion powerboat racing. <laughs> I told Dominic that. <laughs> in 1986, Don Johnson scored his first victory in an 1,100 mile race from New Orleans to St. Louis up the Mississippi River. Wow, that's that, a long way. Yes, and that would lead to for for the next few years him competing regularly in powerboat racing to the point where in 1988 he was crowned world powerboat champion the first and only actor to break through to a tier one motorsports championship wow so maybe that time when he was dancing around in his boat in the harbor showing off how fancy his boat was in the episode uh, mccarthy yeah the great with, mccarthy with the great mccarthy that maybe it was actually stood for something. I told you. <laughs> no one will believe me. Not he always I, drives the boat in the show. <laughs> That's always so him. Not only what not only was he a champion, but he brought a lot of notoriety to the sport and actually influenced advances in V shaped and twin hull technology. That's right, Dominic. Twin hull. V shaped <laughs> and twin hull technologies. <laughs> Integral advances. <laughs> He does know a lot about twin holes, so. <laughs> by the way, by the way, whoever wrote that part in his Wikipedia, very impressed by his uh, powerboat racing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to Don Johnson, the musician. He released two albums in 1986 and 1989. 86's album Heartbeat being the most popular, and actually his single Heartbeat would reach number five on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Which um, we talked about in this week in Vice over the months of the summer. 
which are past now, but a few episodes back in this week in Vice, I talk a little bit about that song too. Actually, that wasn't even his first part being in music. He previously had worked with Greg Allman and Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers Band and co-wrote the song can't take it with you for their out 79 album enlightened rogue damn they actually they people credited him for writing two songs co-writing two songs on that album but what i found through my research is that one song is actually a cover of a bb king song so he can't take credit for that his 89 album would feature the duet with his then girlfriend Barbara Streisand, Till I Love You, it would actually hit in the top 30s and would be actually re released by Barbara Streisand on her 2002 duets album. Heartbeat would also be featured on the Grand Theft Auto 5 soundtrack. I uh, I think less of Don Johnson now said he had his, that one of his girlfriends was Barbara Streisand. <laughs> <laughs> His taste in women is unique. <laughs> yes. For as a actual... handsome as a man he is, it's very unique. <laughs> the actual song Streetwise was never actually released on any Don Johnson album, but was released on the 12-inch maxi single featuring two other songs called Heartache Away and Love Roulette. Streetwise featured Olivia Brown, who plays Trudy, and Whoopi Goldberg providing backup vocals. That's what the all shocking thing is here is, okay, Whoopi Goldberg, that is a surprise, but Whoopi Goldberg's kind of a enigma. Like, I don't, I, but Olivia Brown, hell yeah, yeah Trudy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but actually, Whoopi Goldberg actually shows up on a number of her movie soundtracks as well. He also did another song called No Way Out with Tim Truman for the episode Freefall, which is the series finale. That was only recorded for Vice exclusively in 1989. So Johnson's music career would ground to a halt because his 89s album let it roll would ultimately be considered a commercial failure don johnson actually in the late 60s was also in a psychedelic rock band called horses which <laughs> featured members of the band kingfish that same band would include bob weir of the grateful dead and 300 other members apparently <laughs> um, <laughs> so now that we've talked about don johnson the musician talk about him a little bit as the actor because we know him from vice but let's talk a little bit other stuff with don johnson the actor his first tv show appearance or first tv appearance was in 1965 on the dating game he was not selected oh, ouch <laughs> that lady must be kicking herself now <laughs> yes. can you imagine like, I later spent... on, like i could have dated don johnson <laughs> I literally spent an, over an hour trying to find footage of that, <laughs> and it just does not exist. So We're counting yeah. on you, Vice fans out there. Tweet John. Yeah, find it. <laughs> find me some of that dating show, uh, the dating game footage of Don Johnson, please. <laughs> so in the 70s he was a struggling actor he was in until he was in a stage production directed by sal minu who was actually his roommate at the time called fortune and men's eye that role would actually get him a number of failed tv pilots and a number of tv movies that would eventually lead him to being cast on vice that role that he played don johnson played smitty and sal minu played hockey now sal minu was actually quite accomplished as an actor who was nominated for a supporting role in rebel without a cause the james dean movie but had fallen out of favor later in his career and so this was during a time when he was trying to revitalize himself the production received mostly positive views although its expanded prison rape scene was criticized as excessive and gratuitous and don johnson's so, the victim i, I know that that's yes. the that's what it is he's mm. like that's yes. his first many a young man sentenced to six months in jail for marijuana possession becomes the sexual subordinate of rocky another inmate wow i bring all that up because actually sal minu was murdered in the alley behind don johnson and his shared west hollywood apartment in 1976. they made like a true hollywood story out of that i watched it <laughs> He was wow. stabbed. Wow. He was stabbed in the heart. And in 1979, pizza delivery man Lionel Gray Williams was sentenced to 57 years in prison for the murder. 
and for 10 robberies in the area, even though he still claimed his innocence. Um, is this before or after the gratuitous rape scene? I want to say this is after the gratuitous rape scene. So, okay, just, just wondering. <laughs> yes, this is after. <laughs> after the gratuitous rape scene, while they, when they were living together in Hollywood. Okay. Just yeah, making yep. sure I got this <laughs> yep, right. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Not suggesting anything, <laughs> just wondering. He did totally what he had cool. To... Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, Don Johnson, after that show, would receive roles in small films like Magic Garden of, of Stanley's Sweetheart and actually a sci fi cult classic called A Boy and His Dog in 1975. He would get the role on Vice, and then after Vice, he would do Nash Bridges from 96 to 2001. I watched Nash Bridges, and basically, it was just an expanded version of Sonny Crockett. For sure. It, no one's complaining. CBS <laughs> ran. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no well, one's complaining. Except for no. being it was in San so. Francisco, and there was no Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, he has made guest appearances on Eastbound and Down, playing Kenny Powers' long-lost father. He voiced Lieutenant Falcon in the 1987 G.I. Joe the movie. In 96, he co-starred with Kevin Costner in the movie Tin Cup. Also co-starred in the movie Machete in 2010. And 2012 was in the Django Unchained, among other movies. I'm obviously just pointing out the most famous ones. So just to go back in back to when he was still a struggling actor... Who's in an episode of Kung Fu in 1973? (laughs) He's been in 10 episodes of the TV show Blood and Oil in 2015. Just to to round out the music segment, because I feel like I haven't connected it to him in in a pretty long while. He was also in playing himself in the TV movie called Seriously. Phil Collins in 1990. <laughs> Seriously. Phil Collins. I feel like we are ripe for a Don Johnson comeback, like some prime time or streaming show or something like that, that he's at that. You know, and, and you bring that up and I hear they're trying to reboot Miami fight. I don't know. <laughs> what? It, that, that might be perfect for him. Mm-hmm. If they ever needed a strong lieutenant of the Miami Vice team, oh it would be God. Don Johnson. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, John, I was quite happy that when we I saw that there was only one song on this episode that it was Don Johnson. I was like, finally, finally, we will talk about Don Johnson music. <laughs> Let's go. So, and please, if, if anyone finds that dating game show footage, please forward it to me. <laughs> Let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, John, why don't you kick us off? What are your final thoughts on this episode? This is probably my favorite episode of this season so far. I, I actually I thoroughly enjoyed it from beginning to end. That's without finding any kind of plot holes or corny, goofy antics to enjoy just flat out was well written it flowed well the police work was on point if every show was like this show i could watch it today you know it would be on my dvr i thoroughly enjoyed bill paxton's appearance and wesley snipes appearance and got a kick out of them being as young as they were and knowing that this was like the beginnings of their career so it really like when we talk about we do this podcast because of how iconic vice is and how many people it spun their uh, spun off their careers you know i think this is an episode that's just a full example of that and then just being able to talk about don johnson and the music because we had that <laughs> we had a lot of fun we talked about tubs in the music and i had a feeling don johnson was going to be fun uh, to talk about in the music and i think he was uh i am just from beginning to end i am just ecstatic i i love this episode probably my favorite of the season so far i don't think you're gonna have much argument from people here melissa what are your final thoughts I like this episode, obviously. I mean, I thought I really like Bill Paxton in this episode too, and to think he was like a really, he was just starting out when he did this episode. He is really convincing as a cop that has gone over to the dark side, and he's really confused, and he really doesn't know what the hell he wants and who he wants it with. But I like the episode. I, there's no no silliness, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> I don't like the silliness. I like the serious stuff and. You guys finally have to eat your words because they actually do what they're supposed to do procedurally. <laughs> and they only kill people when they have to. <laughs> not when it's convenient. Uh, <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> not and when Tubbs it just is, saves them paperwork. <laughs> yeah. And Tubbs is like the the saddest pimp ever. He doesn't want to want to hurt anybody. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I know. He felt so bad about <laughs> having to get mad at her. 
you know, but he was so convincing at it too. I agree. I really like this episode. It was all around good. John, you hit on the head. Like it was written well. It flowed well. The acting was good. The guest stars were great. Snipes was great. Paxton was great. I got nothing really to add to what you guys were saying. Like everything is just good. It's a deep episode. All the police teams get involved, except for Zito, and they do their work. They do. They take different angles throughout the entire episode too so crockett's working undercover as burnett and then also working with vic tubbs is the pimp the ladies are working the girls it all just comes together castillo i'm worried about you still but it looks yes. like you got a good team you're getting them better like go home and eat something okay <laughs> go make yourself some food yes. take a good nap I mean, eating, find yourself a good woman something. so much thai food <laughs> go home and meditate in your beautiful <laughs> it was good it was it was a really good episode I have no complaints about that, and that's the first time we've had we've said that in the last few weeks. And I think that it's going to pretty much stay this way for a long time now because we got some deep stuff coming up in the next few episodes. And with that, that's going to be the end of this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We really, really enjoyed this episode of My Advice. We would love to hear from you. Email us gold to gmail dot com. Let us know what you think of this episode and where you rank it. John said that's a pretty strong statement, saying that ten episodes in, this is his favorite episode of so far of this season so we would love to hear from you what does this episode stand for you also want to hear what do you think about the vice team they seem to be growing without zito how do things look castillo seems to be getting his sheep his his ship in yeah. order <laughs> i want to get a sheep in order <laughs> <laughs> castillo seems to get his ship in order so we love to hear from you email us go with the gmail.com go check out the website go with the Dot com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to talk to us. John would love to find the dating game video. Go to the website, yes. click on about us, find out how you can talk to him or email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.